throughout the day we've been talking about different um, uh, issues impacting the community. We've been discussing uh, in the morning Palestine and then the census. Uh, and we had a good conversation at lunch about different, um, what different communities in the state of California and across the country, what issues they're facing uh, and how they're addressing these issues. Uh, today's session, uh, which is titled Rising Above Hate and Compa Combating uh, Systemic Discrimination is an important, uh, co an important conversation uh, and one that we're glad to be having uh, with a great uh, set of panelists uh, with us today. Um, throughout the course of the past year and a half or two years, uh, we have seen a, a number of policies implemented by uh, the Trump administration uh, from the Arab and Muslim ban to uh, the children, uh, families being taken apart, torn apart at the border, uh, ICE raids, detentions, uh, surveillance. So there's, there's all these issues happening, but we tend often to forget that these issues did not start with the election of Donald Trump. These issues have been going on uh, for decades in this country, and they're part of a system, and that's, that's what we want to discuss, and, and how do we move forward? They, they are part of the fabric which make up uh, the judicial system and the political system uh, in this country, and as much as we uh, hate to admit it when we say things like, well, taking, tearing families apart at the border is un-American, uh, really, no, uh, it is American, and it has happened before, and there is a, there is a history of, having, of this happening before. And even with the Muslim ban, saying it's, it's un-American, you know, we, we shouldn't be banning individuals from coming into this country. Well, no, the Muslim ban um, in one form or another was implemented in the past, targeting our community, going back to Carter and Reagan, uh, and even uh, the first Bush and even Obama through the visa waiver restrictions, there's always been an element of uh, discrimination in the laws and policies that are passed. What we want to look at today with our colleagues and with our panelists is where do we stand on some of these uh, some of these issues like the Arab and Muslim ban? Where are we going? What could we as a community be doing? What challenges are we facing now uh, moving forward? We're going to you know open it up with uh, comments from our, our panelists um, on different issues. Uh, but really, we're, I'm pushing more for a conversation uh, on this issue. Uh, and we'll, I'll ask a few questions, then we'll open it up uh, to the floor. I just want to introduce um, our panelists real quick. Uh, to my immediate left is Asla uh, Bali, a professor of law at the UCLA School of Law and faculty director of the Promise Institute for Human Rights. I'm going to read the t names and titles. The bios are uh, in the book. I can tell you each one of our panelists brings uh, uh, an array of experience uh, that we're glad to have with us. Um, and I hope you do take a moment you know, to, to read the bio and understand the work they're doing and follow their organizations and follow their efforts because they're doing great as work. Uh, we have um, Hamad Tajzar. I'm sorry if I butchered your name. I shouldn't as in <laughs> from an Arab organization. I should be saying these right. But uh, staff attorney uh, at the ACLU of Southern California and you joined the organization. He joined the organization in 2017. Uh, Ram Lasahed is the founder and executive director of the Partnership for the Advancement of New America's uh, PANA out in uh, San Diego. We've done a lot of work uh, with Ramla over the past couple of years, and her efforts are uh, amazing in providing services uh, to refugees and new immigrants and working with them to uh, make their transition here to the U.S. easier. Uh, so with that, we're going to get started with Asla, uh, and you'll open us up. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, great. Um, thank you so much, Abed. Uh, so I thought that I would begin by just talking about the Muslim ban um, litigation and what it can tell us about the direction that we might go. Uh, and uh, this is important to me because it really uh, connects me to a long history with ADC, actually. So I got involved with ADC. And in fact, this has been so fun being at the convention because I got to catch up with old friends. Um, I got involved with ADC on the East Coast immediately after 9-11. Uh, and it was in part because of the kinds of draconian actions that, exactly as Abed said, long predate the Trump administration, the Bush administration, the rounding up of Muslim and Arab men um, by their thousands in the New York, New Jersey area, and the need, urgent need at the time, to find representation for detained men. At that time, I was a recent law school graduate. I was living in New York. ADC didn't yet have a chapter in New York. We built one in order to do that detention representation, and then special registration was introduced. And so those years were these incredibly intense years where I had gone to law school at the end of the 1990s. Um, you graduated in 2000, thought that Korematsu was bad law, 
thought that the that, that we had an insidious past in the United States of racial discrimination and animus singling out communities on um, racial and religious grounds, but that it was firmly in the past this kind of mass detention policy. And then within a year of graduating from law school was confronted with it and confronted the question of how to organize to address it. Well, at the time, I worked, I was working as a lawyer in New York, and I worked with classmates of mine from law school, equally uh, in New York, shocked, horrified at what was going on, um, on an immigrants' rights project. And then now fast forward 16 years, I've moved to Los Angeles, I'm a professor at the law school at UCLA, and the Trump election happens, and within a week of his being uh, his entering office, we have the travel ban announced, and I'm racing to the airport, LAX in this case, which is one of the you know dozens of airports where hundreds of people suddenly mid-air as this um, ban goes into effect, the first one instantly, immediately invalidating the visas of people already in mid-travel. And what do I do but I run into one of those classmates of mine from 16 years earlier, detention work, who actually works with Mohammed, who's the um, head now of ACLU Southern California as a legal director, and we just, you know, look at each other totally unplanned and just say, how is it possible that we're here again? How can this be happening mm -hmm. again 16 years later that we find ourselves scrambling to try to build from scratch a strategy for how to represent people who are finding themselves caught up in this insane limbo of legal and bureaucratic chaos produced by, once again, the introduction of policies grounded in nothing other than racial animus in order to basically convey the message and implement it as a matter of policy Arabs and Muslims are not welcome here. We are going to turn this community into a set of second-class citizens. How do we respond to this? What kind of movement do we build? What kind of litigation strategy do we build? So this was a question that we were confronted with, and we joined forces. So I, this time, uh, as an academic, persuaded the principal scholarly association that I work with, the Middle East uh, Studies Association, to agree to be a plaintiff in litigation to challenge the Muslim ban and its impact on all of us as US citizens, on our ability to do work, bring people over for family reunification, uh, enable study, uh, do scholarly collaboration, et cetera. And uh, my friend at the ACLU, and Mohammed's um, colleague pointed me in the direction of the folks at the ACLU who were willing to take on this litigation and we initiated a challenge in Maryland that eventually went up to the Fourth Circuit and then from there to the Supreme Court and became part of the mosaic of the litigation trying to challenge the Muslim ban. So what does the Muslim ban do? It bars nationals, uh, primarily the following five countries, Iran, Libya, Somalia, Syria, and Yemen, as of today, from traveling to the country as tourists, for business, for employment, for family reunification. Um, some nationals are still theoretically able to travel for study or for humanitarian reasons, although in practice, those visas are also not being issued or are being issued at a trickle of the rate that they once were. So for example, allegedly the proclamation doesn't apply to refugees, and yet admissions have ground all but to a halt from these countries on, on the refugee front. And indeed, of course, as many of you know, there's an enormously low cap now on refugees worldwide entering the United States. Uh, there are exemptions, theoretically, for green card holders, dual nationals, those who had valid visas before the third version of the travel ban from September 2017, the presidential proclamation, went into effect. But just to give you a, an anecdote, uh, I run uh, the this Human Rights Institute at UCLA, but I'm also deeply involved with the Center for Near Eastern Studies, and we joined forces to bring an acclaimed um, film director here to screen his Khan award-winning winning film, Silvered Water, which is a film about the carnage in Syria. And everything was set up. He was supposed to be here on October 8th. We had prepared everything. He's a French passport holder. But mm. ultimately, because of the visa waiver rules, because of the combination of the way that this is all being implemented now under the Trump administration, which is to exclude everyone conceivable, everyone possible at every turn, he ultimately wasn't able to come, although we had begun the process of trying to get through this, the security screening as a French citizen that he would need to go through because of his ties to Syria six months in advance. We were not able to complete it in time for him to come here for the October 8th event. We hired an executive director at the Human Rights Institute that I run, a British woman married to a Dutch national, both of them of British and Dutch origin, but both of them human rights lawyers. And her husband has traveled to Syria, has traveled to Iran, has traveled to Yemen as part of his work. She ended up having to travel here with her daughters. Her husband is not able to join her as a consequence, again, of these secondary effects. So not only do we have the principal primary effect of what the Muslim ban has done, but there's a much wider penumbra of people caught up. Anybody who touches the Arab world, anybody who touches the Muslim world is at 
risk of exclusion at this point in this country as a consequence of the deep animus expressed through these policies. So um, that's where the, what, what the ban does and where we are. And it goes, of course, it builds on precedents, including the precedent of special registration, the notion of marking out people based on national origin, specifically from um, Muslim-majority Arab countries. And it also builds on the Obama-era precedents, the visa waiver program, which is the reason that the, neither the filmmaker nor the husband of my executive director are able to travel to the United States at present. But it does a lot more than this. And this is in part because of what the Trump administration has done and be, in part because of what the Supreme Court affirmed in that litigation that I mentioned. So I just want to say a little bit about the Supreme Court decision. And I know that there are, uh, are others who are going to pick up this thread. But the Supreme Court decision is more insidious than anything I could possibly have imagined at the outset of this litigation. Why is this the case? Because Chief Justice Roberts, who wrote for the majority in this opinion, to deflect criticism of his decision, decided cynically to use a lot uh, the the sort of precedent of Korematsu and manipulate where the court now stands on Korematsu as a way of avoiding the obvious um, stink of racial animus that is attached to the decision he was writing in Trump v. Hawaii. And so it, he alleges that he repudiated the Korematsu decision in this case. So the idea is not only have we're affirming this ban, but in doing so we're overturning this other terrible precedent from the middle of the 20th century, which enabled the government to use national security grounds to intern Japanese Americans on nothing other than racial uh, national origin grounds. But in fact, it's first of all arguable whether this decision did overturn the Korematsu precedent. He actually goes to the trouble of saying the Muslim ban has no resemblance to the facts in Korematsu, and therefore anything I'm saying about Korematsu is effectively dicta. In other words, this may not actually be a binding moment to overturn that precedent. But never mind that, the most important thing about what he did is he mischaracterized either in a misleading way or deliberately distorted way at worst, the actual um, reasoning in the Korematsu case. He asserted that Japanese Americans were targeted solely and explicitly on the basis of race in that decision, in the decision. The record obviously shows that the internments were indeed motivated by racial hostility and discrimination. But the decision that Justice Hugo Black wrote in that case minimized that racial context, denied it, and focused instead on the purportedly security-related grounds for the internment policy that were cited by the government at that time. In other words, Justice Black's decision mirrors exactly the logic that Justice Roberts presents in the Trump v. Hawaii decision, in which he chooses, Justice Roberts chooses, to ignore the clear evidence of racial and religious animus in order to focus solely, again, on the purported security grounds for the policy of the Trump administration in order to find it legitimate. The fact that in each of these cases, the order in case in question facially purported to rest on security-related grounds enabled the court to overlook the evidence that racial anim animus, hostility, and discrimination actually drove those interpretations of security. So what Robert's misleading disavowal of Korematsu, which is of course perversely designed to legitimate the court's willingness to defer in this case to security-based pretext for executive policy driven by discrimination, what it actually does is reaffirm the logic of Korematsu for the 21st century. What he has done is rehabilitated something that when I went to law school in the late 1990s was clearly repudiated at every level by every constitutional court expert, by every sitting federal judge. He has laundered it laundered that logic of racial discrimination and animus to single out a community and impose s allegedly national security-based measures against that community defined solely on racial and religious animus. He has laundered that logic from Korematsu and made it valid for the 21st century. So what Trump v. Hawaii is, is Korematsu of the 21st century, and that means something obviously for our community, but it means something much deeper, much more perverse for the country as a whole, for our constitutional law, for where we stand as Americans today. We stand back now more than three quarters of a century, back in the deepest depths of the racist logic of the 1940s, which has been fully rehabilitated and repurposed for anti-Muslim and anti-Arab discrimination. Justice Sotomayor beautifully lays this out in saying that the majority in this case holds the Muslim ban valid by ignoring the facts misconstruing our legal precedent and turning a blind eye to the pain and suffering that the proclamation, presidential proclamation, inflicts upon countless families and individuals, many of whom are United States citizens. That's exactly what this does. Mm -hmm. So where, where do we stand now? What can we do? 
We are confronted, I mean, the Muslim ban is one, as Abed suggested in his opening remarks, of dozens of examples that we could point to of the racist logic that's been pursued by countless Trump administration officials at every level and has been enabled at the state level and at the county level across the country as a consequence of the example that's being set by the president. By the president. We're in a time of a huge spike of hate crimes. We're in a time of enormous retrenchment around, um, unfortunately, exactly the kinds of impulses that I've just been describing. But we're also in a time in which this community and communities with which the Arab and Muslim community are building coalition have never been more active, as we're going to hear from the other panelists. The lawsuit I described at the beginning was just one of seven lawsuits filed to challenge the various iterations of the Muslim ban across the country and its implementation. We are witnessing today in 2018 an unprecedented election season in which Rashid al Saib is just one of literally dozens of Arab Americans who are running for office across the country in a variety of, at a variety of levels from congressional seats to state representatives to city councils everywhere, including just here in uh, California, we have seven Arab Americans that are running in um, competitive elections. We also have as many as 100 Muslim American candidates across the country emerging in races in this election season that have been actually quite successful. Almost half of those running have been able to successfully move on to the general election. So they've made it past primaries and are, and are going out to try to change the complexion of what our legislature looks like and what state houses look like across the country. What we need to do is keep advocating on behalf of the Yemeni Americans, the Syrian Americans, the countless families of the Arab American community that are impacted, that cannot engage in family reunification, whose families cannot come here for study, cannot come here for visits, and so on. And the way to do that is through organizing. It's through movement building. It's through the very thing that this organization does and that we need to rally around and support. We need to organize. We need to vote. We need to run at every level in order to repudiate the policies that are coming from on high through grassroots mobilization. Uh, there have been other kinds of victories that have been won by ADC and other fellow organizations pressuring social media companies, for example, like Twitter and Facebook, to address the hate speech and bigotry on their platforms that amplify the messages that are coming from the federal government, and spotlighting the bigotry of racist officials in the Trump administration, like Steve Bannon and Sebastian Gorka, who eventually were dispatched from the administration, continuing to keep the spotlight on others, like Steve Miller, who's still there running immigration policy and is behind the hate-fueled kinds of uh, changes that we're seeing under the Trump administration. We need to equip the Arab American community and Muslim Americans to protect their rights, to know your rights through com campaigns run again by organizations like ADC, to offer travel advisories to explain clearly to the community what this ban means and what can and can't be done and where the limits must be tested, must be tried, and we need to continue litigation. We see that courts are not the answer. The Supreme Court has made that abundantly clear for the reasons I've described, but litigation remains important to lodge symbolically the fundamental claim that our rights are the same as any other American's rights. We are not second-class citizens. We run for office and we sue when our rights are being compromised by the government or violated by private individuals, and we keep doing that in partnership with and conjunction with movement building and organizing. Mm -hmm. So I leave you with the notion that this is actually a potentially very hopeful moment because there's a level of mobilization in our community and in communities that act in coalition with us that is far greater than we've seen since the aftermath of September 11th, frankly. And so long as the Arab American community can join hands with other organizations in supporting uh, coalition work against anti-immigrant, against anti-LGBTQ, against racist, against misogynist policies and bigotry in this country, we will eventually prevail. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Asa. Uh, next, we're going to hear from um, Hamad. Hamad has done uh, amazing work, particularly on the issue of um, uh, surveillance in our mosques. And, and, and he may touch on that. I'm not going to speak on his behalf, but I know he, he has done a lot of work uh, and that was an issue out here uh, in Orange County, and it's an issue we see across the country, the surveillance in our mosques, the informants, and these aggressive approaches uh, we see by, not again, not just this administration, but ad administrations prior, regardless of party uh, or who's in office. So I'll turn it over to Mohammed. Thank you so much, Mohammed, Mohammed, and thank you all for, um, for having me uh, here. Um, uh, you know, it's my distinct pleasure to be addressing this this crowd and this community um, uh, in an organization that I've long sort of admired um, uh, from afar. So I'm actually really pleased uh, to be um, uh, to be here today. Um, 
uh, and the last name is the last name is Tajsar. Uh, it's Farsi, but my, I'm originally Iraqi. And the the story of how I got my last name is that I had an uh, an Iraqi great grandfather who moved to Iran at a time when Iran had family names, but the Iraqis were going off of the like the the Ashair, the the sort of like uh, you know uh, they didn't have family names, right? So they were going off of tribes and Ashair and other things. So at customs, he. He was told, hey, "What's your last name?" And he's like, "Last name? I'm the son of Kalbam, the son of Hussein, and the son of you know the son of Muhammad from Karbala, right?" <laughs> and the Iranian was like, "I'm sorry, you know, I, I need a last name." And he's like, "I don't know what a last name is." So he said, "Okay, well, you're wearing a kufi, right? So you're going to be a crown head, Taj Sal. So that's how I got my last name. So that's uh, so I am uh, so it's uh, half and half. That's my that's my last name. But anyway, um, what I want to suggest uh, to uh, my, uh, what, what I'd like to do just sort of briefly in, in opening remarks is, is sort of address why I think um, the work that we're doing here together um, to build sort of community amongst each other and amongst other um, communities and other organizations is the thing that's going to get us the salvation and the promise that we want, right? So, I'll, so uh, why do I think that that's the case? Well, let me first uh, um, start by articulating at least my idea of what the problem is that we face, right? And this is the, this is the problem that, uh, um, that Asla actually mentioned when she was talking about the, um, the, the uh, airport protests, right? Which is, wh why is it that we're here in 2018, seemingly in the same place that we were at in 2001, which was seemingly the same place that we were at you know, when the OPEC oil crisis happened, which is also the same place that we were at when the first Syrians moved to Palm Springs like 120 like 20 years ago, right? What, what, what's the story here? Uh, and to me, the, ba the basic idea is that Arabs and Muslims live in a perpetual state of, um, in a state of being in the periphery of what's politically possible in this country. That is, they've never been, and we've never been part of, in any meaningful way, what it means to be in this political society, ever. Uh, and that continues to exist, notwithstanding what we suspect are kind of incremental gains, sort of electoral gains or otherwise, right? So wh what do I mean by saying that we exist at the edge of what's politically possible? Um, what I mean by that is that the only way that people understand the, the, um, the existence of this community is in relation to uh, uh, in relation to in the existential threats that the United States feels it is facing, right? That the only way that we're ever mentioned is in the context of terrorism and security, right? It's whether or not you're, e you're either, um, uh, your community either sort of supports extremism, radicalism, and terrorism, or it denounces it. Whether you're a good Muslim or you're a bad Muslim, whether you're a radical or you're a moderate, whether you're with, with us or you're against us, right? So that idea the idea that we cannot be a part of, of full humans entitled to the full spectrum of sort of existence, right? The full like range of emotions, the full range of political sort of ambitions, the full range of cultural sort of outputs. We must always be understood in the context of whether or not this, um, uh, we are working to undermine the state or working to prop up the state. That position means that we are always on the periphery always on the outside, and we can never fully realize what it means to be human, right, to be a community. I don't think that, I, you know, I, I wonder what you all think. I'm not sure that that has changed, right? And the reason why I don't think that that's changed is clearly, I, I don't think that's changed if we look at sort of uh, the, uh, who's in charge of the federal government. But certainly, I don't think that would have changed had Hillary Clinton won. Every time that you saw Hillary Clinton talk about Muslims, it was the, the following was the premise. M we need to support Muslims because they're going to help us fight ISIS. Was that not every single time that she talked about Arabs and Muslims? That was the idea, right? So why, is that, why does that have to be the case? Why can I just exist? Without having to be, without having to exist in relationship to Al Qaeda or to Daesh, right? I don't know, but that is what I mean when I say that we are at the periphery of what's politically possible. And so the question for us is, okay, well, how how do we move beyond that state? How do we realize our full sort of humanity? 
and our full um, uh, uh, potential as a community. Um, and, and I think there are a lot of solutions to this, and I, I personally don't have a lot of experience. My, uh, what my work is, um, is in the legal area. I litigate cases. I file lawsuits against the government. Um, sometimes we, uh, we win, often we lose. That's kind of what I do, and I've been doing that for some period of time. Um, but the, the solutions here are potentially, um, are, uh, let's see, are extensive. There, there, have to be a multi, there has to be a multivariate approach to figure out how to move from that problem that I uh, articulated to something that's sort of different. And that the solutions there include um, solutions that are built upon uh, community education um, and how we approach our young people and how our young people f feel about their own identities and where they stand in the world. That's the solutions are also um, political, right? How do we mobilize and organize and create political power within our communities? The, sol the solutions might also be economic. How do we develop our own sort of um, economic agenda and develop our own economic interests in a way that means that we have real power in the material world, right? How do we help support our businesses and support our people so that our money stays within the community and helps build up ourselves? The solution might also be cultural and ideological. How do we create, how do we support our artists and musicians, our thinkers, our writers, our philosophers, so that they can develop and, and think through the big ideas that we need to be able to realize our full human Humanity. There's a whole host of different solutions, right? But I, my point here, and I think it's the point, um, I, I just want to sort of double down on Asla's point, that th whatever the solution might be, however it might, whatever form it takes, um, whether it's political, economic, legal, educational, cultural, ideological, whatever it is, the, fun the thing that will make it work and the thing that will, will doom it if you don't do it is coalition building, working together with others, right? I mean, that's a pretty simple sort of, uh, it's not rocket science. But what, um, that, I think, is the way that we are going to develop it and put ourselves in that trajectory that helps us achieve the, the uh, to, helps us fight the problem that I was just articulating. What, why do I think that that's true, right? Is it possible that we can, you know, just ourselves in this room can go off, you know, talk to our family members, talk to our relatives and immediate, uh, and cousins and friends and things like that, and, and start building by ourselves and do the things that we need to do in order to succeed? Maybe, it's potentially possible, I highly doubt it. Here's why I highly doubt it, and I'm going to give you three or four reasons why I doubt it, and I'll leave you with that. The reasons why, first, the reason why I doubt that we can um, achieve the kind of uh, uh, sort of society that we want to achieve, um, uh, with, the reason why I don't think we can do that without coalition building is, first, a political question. If we want to develop ourselves as a political community and help develop the um, and help maintain the electoral successes that Asa was talking about, we have to develop relationships with others so that others can support our political platforms, right? And that's exactly why it, we've had some of these electoral successes. Um, uh, the only reason why those successes can exist is because we've developed a, a program of sort of a political a, a political community that extends beyond Muslims and extends beyond Arabs and folks from the Middle East, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't have the votes. So that's pretty straightforward, right? How do you develop those relationships? Second, how do, um, coalition building is essential to developing the sort of social and cultural um, groundwork for for changing ideas about who we are as a people, right? So in order for us to, for instance, have platforms to, to think about um, our communities and our problems and our issues, or to write about them, or to sing about them, or to, you know, I don't know, play video games about them with, whatever the case might be, we have to be able to develop a kind of network that would allow us to be able to position ourselves so that we can do that, right? We, I can't personally, although I would like to, make a television show that's not about cops, but is about Muslims who get surveilled and beat up by the cops. But every single TV show on, you know, on TV is about, literally is about police or the FBI or prosecutors. I want to make a show that's not about those guys. But how do I do that? I can't do that on my own, right? I need to develop the kind of like relationships and coalitions that I need to develop. Like, I don't even know what it's about, but literally everywhere I go in LA, and this is the thing that you get when you live in Los Angeles, every single billboard is about the show called The Rookie. I don't know what it is, but I, I can tell you, I bet it's about some rookie cop who's like, who is trying to figure out his life and has some like existential issues and is going to do it within the context of a police force that does really terrible things, right? That's kind of what the thing is, and that's, that's sort of like how these things play out. But I want to do something different. The only way I can do something different is if I develop relationships and, I, uh, and sort of think through my struggles with others. 
Similarly, legally, right, this is an area that I know about. How do I develop the kind of, uh, the, uh, the sort of legal architecture that will allow us not to face some of the problems that we face, right? And the, the answer to that is I do it based on precedents and I, issues and ideas that other people that are not Arabs and Muslims have fought for and have won, and I can build on those precedents, right? So I can give you a really clear, easy example. Um, and I think this will drive um, the point home. The, there, is a, um, there was a case that was recently decided in, uh, in New York concerning the retaliatory placement of individuals on a uh, no-fly list by the government, right? So the FBI went to a couple individuals, uh, Muslims, said, hey, if you don't give us information about your, um, um, about your friends and family and colleagues, we're going to place you on the no-fly list. They didn't actually say that. I'm simplifying it a little bit. But the long and short of it is they were like, hey, give us information. If you don't, we're going to punish you. They said, no, we're not going to do it. So what does the government do? They punish them. How does it punish them? It placed them on a no-fly list. What does the no-fly list do? It prohibits you from traveling anywhere on an airplane, right? So, the, um, so those folks got lawyers. And through some brilliant lawyering, we're able to, uh, to, um, to proceed with a challenge against the government that's, um, in which they relied upon a law. It's called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Um, that was built, that law, the origins of that law comes from where, right? Where is the origin of that law that they were able to utilize in order to, uh, to, to win victories against the government for its retaliatory practices? That law comes from, at its origin, is about the right of Native Americans to smoke uh, peyote as part of religious um, uh, rituals. Right? So that the, the origin of that law comes from, the, from uh, communities, native communities, who wanted to, to engage in religious rituals in a way that was unencumbered by the government. So what did these Muslims do in New York? They relied on that law to be able to gain the victories that they won. Right? So that's just a really easy example of what I mean by coalition building in the kind of legal context. Right? So we got to do a little bit more of that. And then finally, I guess, we, all, we certainly have to do that in the context of economic development. I mean, it's pretty clear that the way that we boost, to the way that we build sort of economic power amongst ourselves is to be able to kind of, uh, to, to interact with uh, um, other, uh, uh, other communities in sort of business relations and investments and things to be able to support ourselves. And lastly, I think just as a kind of moral and spiritual matter, I think it's, inc it's incumbent on all of us, if you're, for instance, if you're a person of faith, to be able to develop uh, the kinds of relationships with other communities that don't share your, uh, your particular moral or spiritual outlook to be able to really enrich and deepen your own sense of, uh, of yourselves, your humanity, and your own spirituality. I think that's clear. That's something that I think is important. It's helped me sort of personally, and I think it's important for all of us. So literally at every single axis that you might think that we need to work on to get where we want to go, it is necessary for us to work in coalition with people outside of this space. So I'll leave you with that. I don't, I'm not an expert and how to do that. I only know about it in the context of sort of in a specific particular context, but it seems to me that that ultimately is this one way to get to the road that we want to go to. And I'm happy to talk about it further. Thank you so much. Um, before I go to Ramla, there was uh, Muhammad uh, mentioned and talked about the portrayals of Arabs and Muslims in media, and I'm going to plug our next session uh, in this room, which will talk about uh, that topic and we'll expand on it a, a little bit more. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to uh, Ramla, who's an all-star organizer, somebody who's a, a behind-the-scenes uh, force that's really, um, uh, we're lucky as a community to have her. She's put in a lot of effort uh, in her work uh, and has really uh, impacted the lives of many uh, and really has a good grasp of not only the issues but how the issues impact the community directly and, and how we can work uh, to empower the community uh, on many of these things. So. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you, Abid. I appreciate it. And I really appreciate Asli and Mohammed for kind of setting me up. Um, so I work at an organization called PANA, the Partnership for the Advancement of New Americans. And we primarily are working in San Diego, which is a border community. So we've got the Otay Mesa or San, uh, San Ysidro, Otay Mesa Port of Entry and the San Ysidro Port of Entry. Um, we we receive not only refugees from the Middle, Middle East, Africa, and Southeast Asia, which we organize, um, but we're also receiving asylum seekers, right? And often our challenge locally is how do we find, uh, you know, Urdu speakers who can help um, 
translate for asylum seekers in the detention centers, like understanding and recognizing that our people are coming from all over the world um, as asylum seekers, as refugees, as immigrants, as people who are desperately trying to seek medical support or medical treatment, but also reunite with family. So all, all, in all the ways that our people find themselves here. And the challenge of, you know, what Mohammed talked about is in, in the ways that our people only show up in the public space, right? It's either elected talking about us from a securitized lens, like we're a threat, right? My baby brother who's born here is a perpetual enemy of the state. That's kind of what I'm told, right? And I say that because before Trump, we had uh, a piece of legislation called HR 4038. And I think it was called, um, do you guys remember the title? American Security and Foreign Enemies Act or something like that. It was crazy. And basically what it said is, if you're from Syria and Iraq, you couldn't come here. If you're, if you're a national for, from Syria and Iraq, you can't come to the United States, period. You could be a UK citizen and could not come here because you're a citizen or a national from Iraq and Syria. In addition to that, if you're a professional, like a journalist or an interpreter or someone who has worked in Syria or Iraq in the last five months or five years, you also couldn't come here, right? And this was pre-Trump. And so where were our people? Where, were the, where, was the, the, um, where were the attorneys, where were the advocates, where were the organizers when that piece of legislation were, was working its way through the Senate, right? And I, and I share that because... Trump gets elected, and we're all in rapid response mode. The lawyers are at the airports. The organizers are, uh, you know, rallying. Um, we're doing everything possible to s raise alarm. And unfortunately, that is the story of our community, as Mohammed has mentioned. We are always on the periphery. Um, we're not a community worth protecting. We're not a community who has the full rights of any other human being. And the reason we can't have legis uh, you know, lawmakers, organizers, movement people who really talk about our issues is because it's not, it's, it's, it's not, uh, it's not safe, right? Mm -hmm. People actually get attacked when they stand up for a community, when they talk about our rights. Um, I'm going to put Yolanda on the spot a little bit and, and kind of just share, like, even when... So, Earlier, we were having a conversation about Palestinian rights and why more lawmakers aren't, you know, uh, really talking about the human rights violations, and hum you know, the human, the injustice of Palestine. Um, and a lot of people in the, in the room today talked about, well, we need to be at the table, we need to be fundraisers, we need to be giving to electeds, and when we give to them and we're at the table, they listen to us, right? How many of you think that's true? Yeah. And Yolanda, do you want to share just kind of that example of why that's not true? <laughs> Right. And the reason it's a disconnect and the reason why none of you raised your hand when I said, you know, when we're, even when we think we're in relationship with people and we're donating to their campaigns, because alhamdulillah, our communities are pretty wealthy, right? Like I contribute to political candidates in my lo local community. We do. We show up. We give money, right? They come to our mosques. They give us smiley faces and sit across the table from us and talk about the things that are really important to us. But the reality is our community has, has suffered 
not because we don't have friends, because we're not in solidarity with other communities, because we are, we're at the tables, we're sh we show up, it's because we don't have an agenda. We don't have a political agenda, we're not organized, we don't know what the hell we're fighting for, right? And we're talking, we talk about like, you know, Muslim communities, refugee communities in a place like San Diego, right? Because San Diego, is, it's, 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 it's better than LA, sorry. We're slower, we're chill, right? <laughs> it's not crowded. Uh, Alhamdulillah, like it's, ama it's a really amazing sp community and I'm, I'm really grateful, you know, to have, to have resettled there and to, have, and, to, and to be living there and to have the kind of community, the Muslim and refugee community that I have. But unfortunately, thinking about cross-community solidarity, and when I mean cross-community solidarity is like, where are the Lebanese folk, where, you know, Doris people, where's, where's Doris in the room? Where are the Somalis, where are the Iraqis? You know, where are the Palestinian youth? We're fragmented, we're in, in different spaces, and that is the story of Muslims and refugees everywhere in this country. We have groups that meet, um, we, we, do, we do a great job of doing education events, um, meeting with folks, communicating our culture, but we do nothing to really uh, think about what a political agenda looks like, what a solidarity, cross-community solidarity looks like within our community, because subhanAllah, there's a lot of diversity, right? And it's recognizing and celebrating and being, being grateful about who we are as a people and in all of our diversity and our, and our identity that we can really show up more powerfully, right? Because when we talk about the immigrants' rights movement and showing up for DACA students, we've got youth who can talk about those stories. When we talk about um, surveillance, you know, and the criminalization of communities, like that is our Iraqi and Somali youth in San Diego right now. That's who's being targeted by SDPD, by FBI, right? When we talk about ability to adjust immigration status and just, uh, you know, how targeted people are, we've got Syrian communities who've been here less than a few months in the country. And there are what would be a simple adjustment, you know, just a simple paperwork is now like out of the question for some families, right? Because something happened and RDA is pretty racist, right? So it's like really thinking about in all the ways that our communities are impacted. It's about educating and of course showing up in solidarity with our communities, but none of that will be, none of that will matter if we don't have a political agenda, if we're not organized, if not coming together at the table with an ask, right? And that, and that ask needs to come with a stick, right? Like, because we're not asking because we're nice people, right? We're asking because we're powerful and you gotta listen. So, uh, in San Diego, we're doing a lot to test our ability to really um, visibilize Arab refugee, uh, former refugee um, Muslims and, uh, and, and, and voters, right? Because our community is diverse, so we're, we're really thinking about uh, the communities are, you know, folks from the Middle East, folks from Southeast Asia, and folks from Africa, right? We're also talking about like, what does it mean to really visibilize a community that's like not really reflected in the census, not really, you know, it's hard to pull data about like who, who we all are and how many people uh, live in a community. And so we're doing things like, when we look at the, the voter file pulling uh, voters that are foreign born, born, and we actually select the countries. I wanna know who are the voters from Iraq, from Syria, from Somalia, from Yemen, right? I'm going down that list. We're also working with data people to actually kind of do uh, what are some sort of the most common masa names and how do we pull voters who have those last names or surnames, right? And then when we do that and we can, we can, we can organize a phone, an effective phone banking team, we can organize an effective door knocking program, we can do that as a sustained over effort over years because it, just, it doesn't happen just at election time, right? You, movement building means you're doing the work, working with your people, identifying the issues around year round, right? So when the vote comes, your community is ready. They know what they're voting on, they know what the issues on the ballot is, but also you can show up and say, you know, this is what our voter engagement was like. This is what our effort looks, is. This is what turnout looks like for my community. These are the precincts or the districts where my community has concentration, right? So that means if you wanna win in City Heights, you have to actually give us stuff, that are, like our asks, we gotta actually get it from you. Because we have the power to either elect you or not, right? 
And that's more powerful than just moving money. And I think, you know, one of the things I often talk to my elders about, because my elders, mashallah, like, they're, they have a lot of experience. We can learn a lot from them. But they seem to think that because they gave you money and they, and they, and they, they had dinner with you, that that's, like, legit, like, we're good. We, our agenda is one, right? <laughs> And so young people are sort of educating our elders and talking to them about what does it mean to go beyond that conversation? What does it mean to hold people accountable when they don't do the right thing, when they, when they promise us some things and then just don't deliver, right? And how important that is because we all want to be nice, right? But being nice does not mean giving up on your human rights and, and your dignity as a person. Right? And that is the common mistake that I think we all make is when we assert our rights, whether it's you know, making sure you get an attorney as soon as the FBI calls, because oftentimes when an attorney sends that letter of representation, they stop. Right? They're like, check that dude off the list or that gal. Right? It's too much trouble. We'll find somebody else. Right? So asserting our rights, whether it's the FBI or DHS calling, or it's you know, an elected official, a city council member not delivering on his promise, that doesn't make us not nice, it just makes us smart. It makes us strategic, right? And so that's kind of the, the work that we're trying to build in San Diego. It's a very local effort. However, there are community groups all over California and nationally that are actually incubating this idea of what does it mean to have sustained movement work, strategizing, um, organizing in Masa communities. And Masa is Muslim, Arab, South Asian communities, right? And it's also ensuring that like, we have a tight, tight grasp in our, in, our, in our numbers as a people in our ability to organize and organize smartly, that then we can show up in solidarity with people and actually be an asset to them, right? Because we're not an asset to ourselves or anybody else if we're not an organized people, right? So solidarity is a practice. It means showing up. It means showing up. It means showing up. And it means, again, coming together and showing up, right? It's not a one-time thing. I came, I did my solidarity thing, right? Like, it's a practice. It's a way of living, right? And it doesn't go away after you showed up an event, right? It's sustained effort and sustained engagement. And so it's that practice within our communities. And then it's that practice, again, when we show up with other communities, that we can actually be an asset to ourselves and an asset to other communities and actually build the kind of political power and agenda and win on the agendas that are really meaningful. So my hope, what is my hope? Why, do we, why, do we, why are we talking about this and what do we want to accomplish? My hope is by doing that, right, by investing in grassroots organizing and in year-long movement building around the clock right so that when election times are people are ready then we're doing the narrative change work that matters right so we're not only being talked about as a national security threat but as powerful people who are acting together right we can get those pieces in the media about the Muslim vote the refugee vote you know our numbers in in specific communities and districts when we can do that right we can actually start to make that the, the really important shifts that we need to get legislators to show up for us as well. So when they're passing immigrants' rights bills, that those, the things, the, the details, right? The devil's in the details. The details of those protections, efforts, those policies uh, actually encompass the things that impact our people. So when they're saying, you know, law enforcement can't collaborate with immigration officials, maybe there could be language in there that also says that all MOUs have to be public, especially ones that involve federal agencies on local law enforcement collaboration. Or I'm just making things up right now. But my, what I'm saying is we can actually be in solidarity with other communities and make sure the things that we need are in the po policies, protections, uh, pieces of legislation that are being passed to really include things that matter to our people and, and are centering the experiences our pe of our people in, in, in those uh, protections efforts, right? So we're a service to, to, to our you know, neighbors and, and, and friends and family members, but we're also serving our interests at the end of the day and we're moving, we're moving things along, right? Um, so that's one. The other is really thinking about what, what does it mean to actually have a legislator that, legislator that, it, that says it's progressive? Right? Because how many of you have heard that the state of Galif California is a state of resistance? Everybody, right? But for who? Have we asked that question? For who? Right? 10, 20 years ago, immigrants' rights um, advocacy and like protections was not, not the thing to do, right? Like it wasn't sexy, you didn't get you elected, boo, boo, boo. 
But people did the hard work needed to actually get to a point where now, you know, our legislature is actually doing really bold things, suing the federal government, right, on the, beha on the beha behalf of our citizens and protecting people who are documented, undocumented, you know, and are questioning, like our Syrian families. But how do we, how do we get to a state that actually also thinks about protections for Muslims, people who right now aren't the kind of group that you want to stand with because it can cause you an election? Right? And it's being clear about what are the narratives that exist that are out there and how do we make shifts so that people can stand with us, right? And so the strategies that I think Mohammed Asli and I are talking about are, are, are multifold, but the ones that I will highlight is narrative change, right? We've got to control our agenda or our how we're portrayed, right? We've got to have people who are posting op-eds, you know generating media, you know, doing things to really talk about the things that matter to us and, think, and talk about, um, the, you know, in the ways that our communities are acting together. So we're like controlling kind of how we're perceived, right, in our local communities, because those things add up. It's important. Two, it's like electoral organizing. So in, in addition to community organizing and grassroots organizing, it's helping people politicize and be ready for the vote, right? And using things like PDI, phone banking, canvassing, you know, all the, 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 the tools needed to get people out to the vote. And then keeping track, right? And then re reporting back on that so that we're visibilizing our voices. And the third thing is we actually have to have a political agenda. For San Diego refugees, we, we actually do a house meeting model and produce a report at the end of the day. And then meet with legislators and do a, re a, legis a legislative briefing on that issue and the, on the issues that matter most to our people. So what is it that you need to do in your community? And then how do we, you know, people like me, we're added, you know, we're part of national listservs and, and resources that, can, that you can tap into. And so it's not impossible. People are already doing it. It's nascent, but like we need everybody in he here today to really help us grow it and invest in those efforts. Thank you. Let's give a round of applause, thank you. Um, I appreciate what everyone uh, uh, had to say. It's some good information. I was going to have some uh, remarks, but for the sake of time, I know we started a little behind. I don't want to go too much over. Um, I'm going to open it up for um, questions from the floor. Um, if there are any questions, uh, raise your hand. We'll come to you. Um, actually, uh, I, I need we, we don't have an extra mic. So if you would, yeah, we'll share this one. Yolanda, that's why Yolanda is like a force in the legal department. She's the one thinking. So thank you. Uh, there was a question here. Uh, uh, please keep questions uh, brief um, so we give a chance to answer. Uh. Um, hi, from San Diego. Um, the strategy of cooperating, it's almost like something in our nature. We like to cooperate. And a year ago, Imam Taha in the big mosque in San Diego told me he was sick of cooperating with the police. He was noticing that the male youth in particular in his mosque and his congregation we're not feeling too good about themselves with all these sort of uh, always being put on the defensive. And he said, I'm quit, I quit now being cooperative. Now just, a, so I, is that a strategy and how do we best implement it? Now just a little history on San Diego. Prior to 2009-11, um, San Diego uh, did these educational programs with the police departments in many cities. And it ended up being something ADC adopted nationally after 9-11 and Nadia Kalani was part of that. And um, when the FBI came after 9-11, they said, round up the Arab Americans in your city. And the police department said, no. These are our friends. We're working with them. Get out of here. So we actually weren't rounded up. We were, we were inoculated against that. Since then, we have a good relationship with the police department. We are cooperating. You know what I'm saying? We start drifting towards uh, positions that maybe are not in our best interest. I think right now our relationship with the police is one of... Uh, Sorry, I don't want to interrupt. No, I'll stop, but, again, but, please, but, yeah, but that idea. Please, yeah, to, to yeah. questions because okay. we are running up against time. If somebody wants to grab that, I think it's about uh, a question many organizations and communities face. Uh, maybe a second question and then... Did you, was there, oh, and let's ask a second question. Yeah, and then we'll answer. I hate them had one, and then we'll do the two. But the first one was basically about working with law enforcement, and it's a uh, question 
many of our organizations face. Yeah, I just want to expand on that. So we started uh, a community advisory board, Arab American Advisory Board, to the San Diego Police Department in 2000. And we meet um, probably three or four times a year with them. It's not cooperation in the sense that we share information about the community, because frankly, we have no information to share. Um, it's more about we conduct um, cultural sensitivity training to every single graduating class of cadets. So they graduate a class of cadets about every three months, and we go and do an hour and a half long presentation on the Arab world, our contributions um, to American society, and they get a good healthy dose of uh, Palestine as well. Um, and we always end it by asking the white male uh, police officers, you know, just about to get their gun and their badge for the first time, if any of them feel responsible for the actions of the v Las Vegas shooter, if so, raise your hand. Do you feel personally responsible or the need to apologize for the actions of Dylan Roof, who shot up you know, an African-American church? And no, no one, no one feels responsible um, or apologetic for, for those white men that share your you know, race um, and gender. Well, why are we made to feel like we're responsible for the actions of you know, random Arab or Muslim? Thank you. Um, but if, if there's but a question, please, because yeah. we do. We are running up against. So uh, th th that's a type of work that we do, and we've been doing it for 18 years, and that's been very, very beneficial for us in San Diego. Thank you. Hey, um, had his hand up, and then we'll answer. I, I'm a I'm a cynic, so I would I would challenge the panel to define the community because I'm not sure there is one. Uh, I, I just don't think there is. I think we can probably all agree on some progressive ideas. I haven't heard anyone talk about Black Lives Matter. Uh, I think that the community that you're speaking of uh, would probably uh, be uh, reject uh, LGBTQ rights, many of whom are Muslim. Uh, you know, the Muslim community would reject LGBTQ rights. And I think those are two issues that could unify us with other issues that are going on in this uh, country. And so I would, I would, my challenge to you is tell us what the community is, because I don't know that, that there is one. And, and before I sit down, thank you, ACLU. I'm a member. I donate, and I challenge everyone to donate to the AS, ACLU. Keep suing, keep suing, keep suing. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Uh, who wants to grab the uh, police? I'll just, I think we should yeah. all three yeah. okay. answer this, and I will probably Close. down at that point. And I yeah, know. and then I'm going to add up. Okay. Um, so I'll just briefly draw on my, my experiences from New York uh, on the strategy of cooperating. And, and I think this just varies from city to city. So it's a question of knowing your community and knowing the city. But um, you know, ADC in New York did a tremendous amount of work and outreach to the New York Police Department, the same New York Police Department that was then revealed to be engaging in widespread surveillance of the student organizations and mosques and community organizations that we had invited them to come to in these Know Your Rights trainings that had done all this advisory work and outreach work. And so honestly, I, I mean, I, not that there's, I mean, there has to be a mix of different strategies and a mix of ways that one thinks about both protecting the community and informing law enforcement. So doing you know, cultural sensitivity training is great. You hope that it cuts against the <laughs> overwhelming amount of other kinds of training that are being pre presented. But the notion that developing those relationships inoculates communities across the board would be um, you know, extremely um, naive. And then on the question of community, uh, you know, when I, when we, so the moment that I was describing in New York, there was no ADC chapter, who was the community, who were the Arab Americans, it was primarily wealthy Lebanese Americans. I was the only Muslim and I'm Turkish, who, who was involved in the organization at the time at any kind of a leadership level. But what we built over those years, and I'll, and I'll give another example of what not being in coalition means. So ACLU, you're a member, that's great. We reached out to the NYCLU, which is the New York chapter of the ACLU at that time, to start trying to get to build a set of bridges that didn't exist then, right? So this community was rendered incredibly vulnerable, particularly in the New York, New Jersey area in the immediate aftermath. We're talking about October of 2001, and there were no ties between any of the principal Arab or Muslim organizations in New York and the NYCLU. So I set up a meeting, but then I was supposed to go as a lawyer to this other Know Your Rights training. So the principals of NYCLU were supposed to go to the Anur School, which is one of the important Muslim schools in Brooklyn, to, for a community meeting of lots of people. People were afraid, if you can imagine that moment, to ride the subway to go into Manhattan. Everything is crawling with cops. People who look Muslim are getting picked up for looking Muslim. People aren't <coughs> leaving their neighborhood. So these white 
uh, NYCLU attorneys are going to go to the school in order to be able to meet with the community, but I wasn't able to shepherd them to go there. I went to the New York training, and then I called them afterwards to find out how it went. They, these are people who were working in coalition in the South Bronx, working in coalition all around the city, all kinds of different questions, but they arrive at the school, and the principal of the school says to them, inshallah, mashallah, whatever, and he's wearing an abai, and they, they basically turn tail and run. They, they felt that they didn't have the cultural capacity to uh, understand what was happening. They needed someone to be there with them, and they did not remain for the meeting. The meeting ended up having to wait until the day that I could go with them and organize again the meeting, et cetera. That was our starting point. That same community of religiously observant Muslims, of uh, Arab churches, of all kinds of varied people in New York, over the grueling experience that was truly the crucible of those years as special registration rolled out, as people were really afraid to leave their homes and go into the streets, was in coalition with African American community, you can believe me, did join LGBTQ groups in going out and marching hand in har hand, literally arm in arm, in order to say resist. This was the, uh, the prequel of the Iraq War. By the time we're moving into those protest movements, those same imams, those same principals from schools, members of the community that may not have left Bay Ridge area or may not have left their immediate area in Brooklyn had become accustomed to the idea that they were going to be in the street together, arm in arm, with African American activists, gay activists, uh, Hispanic activists, Puerto Ricans, whoever it may be, walking around uh, trying to build a coalition around the same issues. And if we didn't have those coalitions in place, numerous other moments of crisis would not have would have put us right back in. I mean, the one way in which we're not 16 years back is that we're not building those coalitions from scratch anymore. They do exist. Now, what does community look like in Southern California? Living in Los Angeles, it's a much more spread out city where people are much more fragmented. There isn't the kind of concentration density that you had in New York that made it possible to answer the question literally, I could physically see what the community was. I knew who they were, I knew where to go, and I knew what it meant to build those coalitions. I think it's more complicated in different parts of the country, so it's a regionally answer, a question you would need to answer regionally, but if, if you ask me who was standing with Black Lives Matter in New York at the very beginning as those protests were going on, I would answer you, Linda Sarsour. I would answer you with names of literal people that we worked with in those days and that have continued doing that organizing and community work. So I think it's unfair to say that Arab Muslim and, mm -hmm. uh, the Arab and Muslim communities are not mobilized, are not active, and are not acting in coalition. They are. May not be every single person, but there are leaders in these communities that have built those partnerships, that have built those bridges, and that's how we're going to move forward. And ADC has been at the forefront of that in countless cities across the country. Uh, yeah, just a few points. Um, uh, just real quickly, I mean, I think the, the cooperation point is a really is a really helpful one. I mean, for me, uh, as with any question about uh, about tactics and strategy, you first start with okay, what's your what's your vision? Um, how are you? What is your goal? What are you trying to do? And then, what tactic best serves your interests? Like, what are you trying to accomplish? And does cooperation or does sort of hostility, does organize, does, what, what kind of tone are you gonna take to power and is that going to help you? In my experience, um, uh, in my experience, you cooperate with people that are your friends. Um, and it seems to me, based anecdotally and from some of the work that I do um, at the ACLU, that the people that we, that law enforcement in general, particularly from the, net, from the federal government, but certainly from local, um, from major metropolitan cities, law enforcement is not your friend. I mean, that in overwhelmingly is the kind of, uh, is the, is is based that's based on data, right? That 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 we have. Um, uh, uh, this is true. Um, but you know, you you can uh, if you can look at the New York example. You can look actually right here in Orange County. I'm part. Um, I helped work on a, on a lawsuit that's currently pending. Um, involving the massive widespread dragnet surveillance of Muslim Americans here in Orange County um, by the FBI who employed an informant to literally go um, at 4 a.m. Um, to mosques all over Orange County and to write down license plates of individuals who went to Fedra prayer in the morning. Why? Because those individuals were believed to be more Muslim because they got up, woke up, and went to the mosque at four in the morning. And because they were more Muslim, they're likely to be more dangerous. Right? That's what the that's what the FBI was doing at the time. And the head of the FBI, Robert Mueller, 
remember this, remember him, right? The, the person with whom we have, we have put in all of our faith in the resistance. He was the one who would come to them. He came to the mosque and said, we're not looking, came, literally came to mosque in Orange County and said, we're not surveilling you at the same time that they were in fact doing that. Literally exactly what yeah. happened in New York Police Department. These guys are not your friends. Uh, and there's a reason, and so I don't cooperate with people who are not my friends. I think the, um, uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, I think on the question of community, I, I, I would sort of rest, I guess, on, on Asa's point. I think it's, um, it's complicated. I think there, there, are, there are lots of folks who are doing good work here, um, who are part, uh, who are civic leaders within our sort of, um, that we know and that we respect, and there are a lot of folks for whom that kind of coalition building work is sort of not, a, not at all on their radar. And so I think it's incumbent on them, on us, to be able to organize them and educate our leaders to be able to do the things that we think are important. And that often means that we do a little, we do something, some things that our parents taught us not to do, which is to talk back to our elders. But that, that must, <laughs> that you know, sometimes it's got to happen. Thank you. Uh, um, Ramos, and I, you I won't repeat too much of what's already been said because 100% agree with what's already been said. And to crystallize a little bit, I think what um, Nadia and uh, Doris were talking about is two different things. One is uh, law enforcement officers because San Diego is a military town. That's just the reality. New police recruits often come who are often like ex-military and are in our, in our neighborhoods, right? And so cultural um, sensitivity training, these things are really, really are important. And I say that as someone who, uh, in the neighborhood I grew up in, City Heights, our mid-city substation was like the worst place you want to be as, an as a new officer because things are happening. And so we would get all of the new recruits, literally. So every two years we'd have new, brand new ca graduated uh, cadets. And so during barrel days, which is kind of the one day a month, I think, that all the officers in that substation are doing training, people would come in and actually do specific training for that substation, right? That was really important to us because what was happening out of that substation was pretty dangerous, right? I mean, we didn't know what was happening. People would come and actually go into people's private homes, do search without a search warrant and say, go to the substation. And we go to the substation and they'd be like, we don't know what you're talking about, right? Like really egregious like violations. Um, doing things like having our elders open their mouth and taking photos because they assume somebody's chewing got, you know what that is if you're Yemeni, right? Um, so these are the things that are happening. And so cultural sensitive, sensitive, sensitivity training is important. Mobilizing and organizing and uh, like suing them sometimes uh, works. Um, and that's different from what I think Doris raised, which is community law enforcement roundtables, which have also been happening in San Diego. And largely those tables are being sponsored by a uh, U.S. Attorney's Office um, to spy on the community, really, to try and figure out what social service organizations and individuals are willing to cooperate with them to spy, right? And those things are dangerous, and we absolutely do not want to participate at those tables, right? Um, and then to answer the question around, like, who's the community? Yeah, it depends. That's a regional question. It depends on where you're at. But if I talk about my community, so PANA is a black-led organization. I don't know if you've noticed. <laughs> So, so we can't be anti-black, and we have to absolutely stand for Black Lives Matter, right? And we see our community's uh, struggles as connected, because they are, right? There's no separating my Muslim identity from my brother's black identity, right? In addition to that, um, the things that we've been practicing internally, and we're not pretty loud about it because of the things that you've raised, right? Like, my elders won't accept the fact that I will hire an LGBTQI identifying young person to organize. Sometimes, though, you know, it, what is what is the end result you want to achieve, right? Is my end result to convince somebody that this person's human rights is just as important as yours, or you know, by just talking to them, or do I want them to experience and have a meaningful relationship and have that person actually accept that community person, right? In the community, so it depends, right? And so we have a Palestinian you know, questioning, gender questioning individual who's organizing in our community. Some people know, some people don't need to know, right? Um, in addition to that, we've got folks who are asylum seekers from, for example, uh, one of our members who will be speaking at our Power Hour event on the 25th is an asylum seeker who's being who was persecuted back home because he was standing up and supporting LGBTQI rights, right? So who's your community depends on where you are and where you're organizing, but I would say, you know, it, like it's absolutely important that uh, as we have to organize. We have to organize, um, like I mentioned earlier, I think what I said was cross-community solidarity, right? And it's two parts. One is internally, 
within our Middle Eastern, African, Southeast Asian groups that PANA organizes. But then it's also once we have a political agenda and we're visible, showing up at immigrants' rights tables mm -hmm. and at other tables and being in solidarity with communities who also have similar struggles. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I mean, just a quick comment on those. Uh, uh, as far as the law enforcement and ADC, I mean, there was a time where we were giving, uh, we were giving these trainings. We've pulled back um, over the years since I became legal director. We've pushed back and moved away from uh, too much engagement with law enforcement. We do it in a way where uh, if there's issues, we discuss it with them. If there's an opportunity to uh, provide some training about the community and who we are, we'll look at it carefully to see if it's going to have any benefit or if they're just checking off a l the mark to say we met with the Arabs. Uh, so we, we have scaled back a lot of our, uh, a lot of our law enforcement uh, work. Um, as far as the LGBT issues, um, ADC, years ago we passed a resolution, uh, our board resolutions, uh, calling for uh, equal rights for LGBTQ, and, and, and we were behind on the uh, same-sex marriage issues, and, and um, we are asylum, uh, the asylum services we offer uh, are many uh, individuals from our countries coming here to claim asylum because of uh, their fact they're LGBT, and, and we've been entrenched with that community and those issues uh, for a number of years now. Um, and on the Black Lives Matter front, uh, uh, Yolanda will touch base a little bit on that real quick as well. Yeah, so last year ADC officially became a physical sponsor a physical physical sponsor for Law for Black Lives, which is the new developed legal arm of the Black Lives Matter movement. And particularly we're a physical sponsor for the DC chapter um, here um, in on the East Coast. But we're increasing our efforts there because we recognize our role and responsibility to also engage and support communities of color. Um, as a product of that as well, mm -hmm. as you notice, uh, when no ban, no walls, no raids came out, there were African-American lawyers who showed up to those airports too, defending Muslims and Arabs. And a major um, focal leader of that was Debbie uh, Montessor, who organized and even got the Spanish bodegas to boycott and close down their shops in New York City hmm. and show up in and, and, and solidarity with the Yemeni bodegas who, who shut down. So there are um, crucial leaders in that. There's, of course, more work to be done. Um, ADC has done that. I'm working a lot on the even afro mortarian stays. Um, the recent afro mortarians have been essentially put into deportations, and they risk slavery if they return to Mauritania. And so we see it as our role to also help our Afro brothers and sisters in that regard, as well as working with those from Djibouti um, and Afro-Egyptians. Thank you. Interesting. And we also uh, do, uh, we, we work closely with the, uh, Embassy of Somalia, a number of issues. So we are reaching out to, trying to broaden that definition of community where it's not just an organization that represents or works with folks from Lebanon, Syria, and Palestine. So we are pushing hard. I'm sorry about the questions. We have to wrap up for our next panel. We're pushing really hard uh, on time. Uh, but we're going to break now. And then um, 4.05, let's meet back in here at 4.10 uh, so we can have our next session, which is a, uh, we'll continue part of this conversation in a bit more uh, about the uh, uh, imagery of Arabs uh, in culture and so forth. Thank you.